Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi al-kareem. Amma ba'ad. So in our last class, last week, uh, Alhamdulillah, we discussed uh, Imam Abu Yusuf and his um, his background, his uh, period of time that he was living, and also his own methodology, how he was looking into you know his uh, his work and he, uh, how he was able to uh, do his work and what was his uh, relationship with Imam Abu Hanifa and we also talked about especially the Hanafites their background and, uh, why they are being they are called they were called uh, Ahlul right and then we have Imam Malik and their followers and why they were called Ahlul Hadith right so i think we talked about kufa the methodology of kufa and we talked about the methodology of uh, medina right so all these things we talked about it now i think we need to go into his book it's magnum opus uh, kitab al kharaj right so that is what uh, today uh, we're going to talk about the contents of al kharaj and also we are going to um we are going to um discuss one issue from the book and um, how he was able to uh, bring that issue out and how he was able to solve the problems and how is that is going to be uh, helpful for us do, through this class how is that what what is there actually for us to learn and how we should actually react um, uh, how do we actually uh, use quran and sunnah and athar and qiyas ijma and qiyas you know how we actually can come into contemporary uh, we can actually apply those things you know these are the things uh, we are we are going to learn today uh, so um, let me start with uh, you know this uh, the word itself all right kharaj uh, what exactly kharaj means uh, because this is a very famous word al kharaj simply means uh, taxes all right um, kharaj also is a part of uh, the sources of government and revenues, sources of government revenues, al amwal al amma, or you can call public wealth or finance, public finance, such as we have ghanima and uh, we have zakat, and then the last one is actually fight. So I think uh, you, you you will uh, you will inshallah get the updates. Uh, you know class after class uh, since we are actually starting uh, very early meaning to say that uh, we are starting the work of early Muslim scholars but by the time you know you go for the second the next centuries to next centuries to next centuries the things will be more clear uh, you know we are talking about the time that everybody has their own ishtihad and every ruler want to follow their own there was a no uh, single system everybody has their own system and uh, that's the reason why uh, you know there was um, what do they call it in malay they call the word kalam kaput huh? there was kalam kaput there was all mixed up uh, uh, that was the reason why uh, 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 why uh, Harun al Rashid in first place he requested Imam Abu Yusuf to write something on Kharaj because he saw that everyone is actually doing on their own and we don't have the clear indication so he wanted a legislation a book that actually can guide on these taxation issues so over that time, you will see the clarity. But at the beginning, you know, people talk about Ghanima, people talk about Fai, and then Kharaj, and Al Jizya, Ushur. But the fact is, I think when you come and 
when when during Ibn Taymiyyah, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah's time, when I, eventually we are going to learn about Ibn Taymiyyah, he will clearly, you know, uh, put everything in his book. He will classify these things. Okay, he will be saying that there was a ghanima and then of course there is uh, zakat all the time uh, right there is a purpose uh, then he talks about he will be talking about the uh, sources of ghanima and the expenditures of ghanima then he will talk about the sources of zakat and the next expenditures then the last part is actually very complex part the last the third part is actually something that will cover the entire taxation is that what we are doing today it is called phi right so you have phi and then you have inside the phi uh, on, on, under the category of phi then you have so many uh, starting from al haraj al jizya ushur right uh, you have like sadaqa you have like max uh, you have like uh, the, the, the custom tax you know everything comes together uh, so let us actually see uh, one by one all right so what exactly haraj means haraj is not something that only muslims they started it is not haraj was there even even long time ago even 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 before uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi of course not only even before even before zulqarnain if you remember the Quranic verse, the story of Dhulqarnain, you will see the word Al-Haraj because the people, uh, they request uh, the king, Dhulqarnain, asking him to build a wall against the Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Then they will be saying that, okay, let us pay you through Haraj. So the word Haraj is already there. So even pre-Islamic, the word Haraj was there. It's not something new. So if you, if anybody uh, own your land, and uh, from the land you have to pay taxes every year, all right? This is what haraj actually, basically haraj means, all right? Then you have a jizya. You can call it jizya poll tax. This jizya is actually something. Um, it's a kind of punishment, all right? Because uh, we won your country, we uh, Muslims came to your country, they won the battle, but you still non-Muslim. You are not uh, you are not accepting Islam, then you can actually become a zimmi. It's called a zimmi. It means that you are under the protection of Muslims. You are actually harbi and zimmi, two different things. Harbi and zimmi, both of them non-Muslims, but harbi is the one who uh, lives in uh, a non-Muslim country, but uh, is a non-Muslim, but living in non-Muslim country is also an enemy of Islam, Harbi, the one who is ready to fight with his Muslims. Zimmi, the one who is a non-Muslim, but lives in Muslim country. Uh, so he did not uh, accept Islam, so he has to pay jizya. It will be counted per head, all right? So as long as he is who wants to stay under the protection of Muslims, he can actually has to he has to pay he has to pay uh, jizya. But the moment he accept Islam, he doesn't need to pay jizya. He will be a free man. Uh, that is what actually jizya means. Then you have ushur. All right. So now when I talk about ushur, remember uh, ushur is not uh, one thing. There is one more which is ushur. Right, Ashur is actually Ain Sheen Ram Ra, which is actually one uh, tenth, they call it. All right, so you have uh, one portion, but you make it into ten. Then the tenth portion called one tenth is called Ashur. This Ashur usually comes from Sadaqah, from Zakat, actually. You know, um, if you have a farm, farming land and you have the harvesting, the crops. And you are supposed to pay uh, five percent if you have the irrigation, the water irrigation. But you have to pay ten percent if you don't have the irrigation. It is called ushur, but it is different from ushur. All right, ushur is actually ain sheen wa uh, which is actually different because um, 
it's called custom tax uh, if anybody brings uh, any items uh, like for example imports and exports like today the commodities being imported or exported then the certain uh, when it comes to the market so before it reaches market uh, you have to pay uh, the custom tax all right uh, again um, this uh, Oshur also similar to Kharaj, uh, it is also similar to Zakat and Sadaqa. The, the truth is, when we talk about Oshur, we are not talking about Oshur, Oshur is different, but we talk about Oshur. Okay, Oshur. This Oshur often time also used as an alternative words for Kharaj, alternative word for Zakat, alternative word for Sadaqa. So there is no proper definition being given. Um, uh, uh, even by Abu Yusuf also it was not given proper uh, definition for Oshu. Sometimes he also used the word Oshu as a haraj. Anyway, we will come back to that later uh, to discuss what exactly the differences are. Then you have um, the word Max. Uh, Max, uh, Max also, Max also, Max are Mukus. This is also pre-Islamic. Usually, um, you know, this, this word Max is actually alternative word for customs tax, which I called you earlier, Oshur, uh, with wow. So this is called custom tax. There's another name for it. It's called Max. Uh, in Egypt, they were using this word. Uh, usually, uh, you know, uh, when uh, the cultivation and harvesting is over, and then when they bring those cultivations, uh, crops to the market, uh, they, uh, the, 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 the government will, will ask uh, the, 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 the business people, the one who bring the traders, they ask the traders to pay the max. So the government will find, of course, will get the, will get the uh, zakat at the level of farmers, because the farmers, they have to pay zakat. But when it comes to market, the traders, uh, they have to pay Max, all right, which is actually custom tax, all right. Then you have another one called task, ta sin of, all right. This is called task tax. So this uh, task is actually what exactly it is. Uh, you know, the government is actually is, may give some uh, uh, lands uh, for uh, as a rental basis. You know, the government may give you some some lands. So that you can work on it and you can do uh, you can manufacture something using that land or you can do some agriculture product using that land but it's like it's a borrowed land from the government it's not yours but still you have to pay taxes every year so this is all called at this then you have zakat and sadaqah i think all these things you, you you already know so this is what basically uh, this uh, means uh, the specific to land. I mean, the 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 alam al 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 We call it sources of government revenues. So everything that we have today, whatever the taxation system that we have, of course, it was actually there. From there only the modern tax system came came into existence. So now uh, we are going to talk about uh, the the original contents of Kitab al Kharaj. I think. Uh, I, I really love to, you know, um, uh, read uh, the entire book. It is, of course, the book is in Arabic. Uh, of course, also it's been translated by uh, Bin Shams. Um, but, but, but I really love to read, you know, the, the entire book to you and then see what he has done. But uh, I don't think time permits. Uh, that's because every week we have to finish a scholar. So meaning to say uh, we have around uh, 12 to 14 scholars to finish. So that's the reason why I want to just uh, go with uh, one issue that I read from the book and I want to uh, share with you that one content of the book. All right, the rest all I, the rest all I think you can go through through the slides and you can read. So what I want to, uh, the reason I'm telling you this, uh, this issue, this, uh, this one, uh, content of the book uh, so that you actually can understand how um, how ishtihad should be done uh, how ishtihad should be 
uh, you know, uh, should be formulated, should be, should be, uh, what is, what is the formation of ishtihad? You know, it has to be from Quran and Sunnah. How, and how it should be uh, presented to the gover current government. All right. So uh, before I start the issue, I mean, I start one of the content of the book, I would like to give you, uh, give this uh, kind of taste, you know, uh, what happened uh, during one time, uh, because this is what uh, I'm, I, I want to also bring the methodology of Abu Yusuf. So you see, um, um, once, uh, this is just a taste to see his methodology of how he looks things, all right? So once one friend of Imam Abu Yusuf, he brought, uh, he said, uh, he, 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 he conveyed a, 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 a hadith, all right? Uh, while uh, Imam Abu Yusuf was getting some gift, all right? So Abu Yusuf was getting received some gift, perhaps maybe from friends or some other people. Then this friend came and said, do you know the hadith? Prophet Sallallahu said, if you receive any gift, you must share with your friends, right? Uh, the hadith talks about your gift must be shared with your friends. Then Imam Abu Yusuf replied to him, uh, I know this hadith, but you didn't understand the hadith. The hadith, the context of the hadith is, talks about the milk and dates. If you receive milk and dates as gift, then you should share with others because milk and dates, first of all, you cannot keep it for long. But second of all, it is quite important food for everybody. So milk and dates should be if it is so now the context of the hadith if other than that if someone gives you money if someone gives you uh, for example your some dress or someone gives you some other thing other other things other than the food then you don't have to share everything that because this is yours it's been given to you and you can actually keep it is good you share but not necessary it is it is compulsory on you to share but if it is Food items, better, compulsory on YouTube. So I just want to give you this idea, you know, how he can understand the context of hadith. Anyway, coming back to one of the content of Kitab al-Haraj, uh, was, it was quite interesting for me when I was reading, uh, there, is, there, there, there was a chapter called Safavid, all right? So I want everyone to concentrate what I'm saying, okay? This is sometimes uh, it may take you somewhere. I mean, I don't want you to lose. If you lose the place, stop me so that I can repeat. Uh, this is the topic of Safa with the land. What what means Sawad? Sorry, Sawad land. What means Sawad? Sawad means, of course, the meaning is actually black, but it doesn't mean black here. Sawad means um, there, uh, you know, um, during uh, Abu Yusuf time, uh, sorry, during Hazrat Umar ibn Khattab, not Abu Yusuf, Abu Yusuf came later. During the second Khalifa, Umar ibn Khattab, which is actually Hijri, within Hijri 20 or something, within within 20, right? Because Imam Abu Yusuf came after 100 years. Imagine, I'm I'm bringing you the 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 the, the, uh, the story of uh, Hazrat Umar, which actually Imam Abu Yusuf narrating the story in his book. He says that um, uh, the Sawad land issue came to Hazrat Umar. Usually, uh, any land comes to uh, any land captured by Muslims because every time they go to war, they capture land, and every time uh, uh, land has been captured by Muslim, the land always will be given to Muhajirin, all right? Because it was the Prophet Wasallam's practice. Okay, you got me. The practice was this any new land comes the land must be given to muhajirin it was the practice of sallallahu alaihi wasallam sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't say this actually you get the land you have to give it it was what prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to do when he was alive so now during the second khalifa hazrat umar uh, there was a sawad land 
the Sawad land means uh, it's, it's a green land, they call it. Green means uh, during um, during his time, there was the Iraq, uh, after Kufa, Iraq, there were uh, borders in Iraq. From those borders, um, the new, this is called new expansion, right? So this is called, okay, this is where actually Islam was actually, Islam was expanding. So they reached Iraq, after Iraq, they went, they go on Khurasan, today's Iran and everything being called. So in that particular area, there was a green, uh, green area, which is actually very good for agriculture. So now, um, according to Imam Bilal, Hazrat Bilal, and also uh, according to Abdul Omar Nahaf, they came and told, uh, we got this land, and this land must be given to Muhajirin. Of course, Bilal and Abdul Omar Nahaf, both of the Muhajirin. You know, this, this, these two people, they came from Mecca. And then, uh, Hazrat Umar ibn Khattab was thinking about it, and then he said, I don't have to give to Muhajirin. And then uh, Bilal and uh, uh, Abdurrahman Ibn said, how come you do something against uh, Prophet Sallallahu practice? He said, do you, do, do you, you know that what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in Quran, Ma Afa Allahu, if you, if you look at the word Ma Afa Allahu, this, uh, this word, Allah, when Allah says, whatever that uh, Allah is giving you as a gift, uh, through the wars, this is for everybody. Allah says, Allah says, for everybody, not only for Muhajirin, He says for Muhajirin, Wansar, and all Muslims. So now, here, Hazrat Umar wants to keep this land for everybody so that you can get some revenue. What happens that when you give to Muhajirin as a gift, of course, Muhajirin may keep it, or maybe he can, Muhajirin may give it to somebody as a gift. The problem to the government is uh, the government will not get any revenue from those lands that been given to Muhajirin because they cannot collect haraj from that land. If you give it to somebody as gift, you cannot collect haraj. Thanks. Hazrat Umar was thinking, if I give this land to the same people from where we took it, because those people, they know the land, those people they've been doing the agriculture and then it is also a kind of support to the same people so that the same people will continue to do the agriculture and then they can also send the taxes to Medina, the taxes to Hazrat Umar ibn Khattab. This idea was actually came uh, to Hazrat Umar ibn Khattab and then he asked Hazrat Ali, he asked Hazrat Uthman ibn Affan, right? So everybody, you know, he asked Hazrat Talha, everybody said this is the very good, uh, very good ishtihad you can do. Because Prophet Sallallahu did not say that you should give to Muhajirin. It was Prophet Sallallahu practice. But remember, when you, ha you are expanding, the things has to change according to what Quran says. So now, what Hazrat Umar did was right at that time. Not only that. He also brought this idea of, you know, those people who are going to get Safad land, if they are really, really very much poor, then they have to pay only 12 dirhams per year. If they are a little bit good, they will pay 24 dirhams per year. If they are very rich, if they are very good in their agricultural product, then they have to pay 48 uh, dirhams per year. So 48, 24, 12. These are the kharaj that they have they are supposed to pay all right even though they are uh, non muslims all right and then the the the, the, the they are, they comes under under the uh, uh, conquer of muslims uh, yes of course they have to pay jizya at the same time they can keep the land but they have to pay taxes as a kharaj so now you this is what imam um, Imam Abu Yusuf bringing this hadith, this story of telling, telling us that, you know, this is how ishtihad should be done. So that he says that uh, Hazrat Umar was collecting haraj based on the measurement of the land. Right? He is saying, 
So this is where the second part is coming. The story still continues. Huh? So please uh, hear me out. It didn't stop. It actually just getting started. Hazrat Abu Yusuf says, Hazrat Omar was doing this based on the measurement of the land. So he will collect the taxes. So for example, you have 5,000 square feet, you have to pay these taxes according to that uh, 12, 24, and 48, right? But now this is what actually the practice was being done until Imam Abu Yusuf. As I told you just now, it's been 100 years. Within these 100 years, so whoever get haraj, the, uh, they are, uh, they are, their land must be uh, measured and according to the size of the land, they are supposed to pay the taxes, right? But here is the problem. The problem what Abu Yusuf saw was this is actually not so right because this is this because we are not talking about the the sawad now, now because now the islam islam expanded not until iraq during the Hazrat umar period until iraq but now during abu yusuf period it already went until sindh today what we call pakistan those places you know and then the other side it went until spain so now not every land like sawad because Sawad, remember, as I told you, is a green land. So anything you put, it comes out. And then, now, there were so many other land given to so many other people. And then the practice was what Hazrat Omar was doing. Everybody, all the rulers were following what Omar did. Omar was collecting tax based on the measurement of the land which Abu Yusuf opposed to it. He said, you cannot collect the tax based on the measurement of the land because not all the lands are Sawad land. Because there are so many land, there is no crops. There is no uh, cultivation. How these poor people supposed to pay taxes? And then he also brought the interpretation why uh, Hazrat Umar was able to pay, uh, uh, able to ask taxes according to the measurement because he always sent uh, two people. For example, he used to Hazrat Umar used to send um, uh, he used to send uh, Hazrat Khudaifa, and also there was another one, Uthman bin Hunayf. So these two, uh, two, uh, these two, uh, two uh, these two uh, people that Hazrat Umar used to send Khudaifa and Uthman ibn Hunayf to check how people are doing in Sawad land, and then they come back and they reported. They used to come back and report to Hazrat Umar saying that they are doing very good because their crops are very good. So as long as Hazrat Umar was hearing, he has no problem in collecting tax. But today it's not the case. As I told you, there were 100 years of gap. So today the issue is not everybody uh, doing very good in, form, in farming. Uh, their land is not like Sawad. So Abu Yusuf, according to his own ishtihad, he introduced new system called Mukasama. Uh, now let us talk about Mukasama. What is Mukasama? Mukasama is you know there were two uh, way of collecting tax uh, before this before mukasama was uh, introduced there were two way of uh, measure uh, collecting tax one was measure the land right and then according to the land you collect the other one was measure the crops according to the crops then you take the money out of the crops all right but abu yusuf said um, uh, you know, uh, first of all, uh, according to the measurement of the land is wrong. Second of all, according to the crops, and then you take the money according to the crop, also wrong. Why? Because when you go and do you do the measurement of the crops, uh, you say that, for example, they have, uh, let's say, 1,000 dirhams of uh, crops they have. So you take, let's say, 100 dirhams from them which is not fair because we don't know the price until they reach the market. 
because when they reach the market, there's a possibility that the farmers may get less profit and then you are collecting more tax. So then he introduced the mukasama, which means you go to the crop, you go to the land and you see how much they have crops. From the crops, you collect the percentage of the tax in kind. Do not collect in money. Collect, let's say they have, uh, let's say they have uh, dates, you collect 10% of dates or 5% of dates. And then as a government, you bring the dates, you bring the crops to the market and then you convert into money. This is what actually convert into dirhams or dinars, you know, this is what actually mukasama, uh, mukasam, mukasama practice. All right. So, so this is just you know one example of what uh, the contents of Al Haraj is to give it to us. There are so many things like this. So, so let us just go there one by one with this uh, contents of Kitab Al Haraj. Of course, it was prepared for by the order of Khalifa Harun Rashid, the Abbasid dynasty. It is not limited to matters of revenue, but also deals with um, all the affairs of the state. And, uh, you know, he focused a lot on the tradition of the rightly guided caliphs and avoided courting the conduct or the decision of the Byzantine, Iranian, Umayyad, and Abbasid king, except Caliph Omar and Abdul Aziz. Basic conception of the state, spirit of democracy, duties of the caliph. You know, as I told you, the first, first chapter, you know, um, he starts talking about how a good ruler should be you know he he gives the book to to uh, to to to, uh, to harun rashid but he says to harun rashid how you should behave how you should be what should what your characteristic should be you know i don't think any 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 writer can do that to any president or prime minister today but you know abuse was able to do because he did enough but he was not afraid so the first chapter is dedicated to the ruler how you should react how you should behave then only he did start talking about the the, the taxes uh, then he talked about the um, uh, public treasure principle of taxation lane settlement appointment of governors and public officers judiciary equal treatment to the court of law jail reforms you know all these things he's been talking about then uh, this is what we have in the economic ideas in Kitab al-Kharaj, uh, such as taxation, today what we call taxation, public finance, agricultural production and prices, everything is was there, all right? Because he considers uh, the land as the source of wealth, right? So, <laughs> you know, you remember this, uh, this statement? Uh, we talk about the land as a source of wealth, you know, when we discuss the uh, physiocracy, uh, we talked at the French physiocrats. We talk about his right land as the source of wealth, but it was just uh, thousands and thousands of years ago. Imam Abu Yusuf already talked about it, right? He made detailed suggestion on socio-economic infrastructure and public work and showed to meet developmental expenditures on building bridges, dams, and irrigation works. Economic responsibilities of the state to economic welfare of the people, water supply, fisheries, forest and pastures, lands and the ruler's duty to regard public money as a trust. You see, all these things he was able to talk about it, which was actually not exactly available in Quran and Sunnah. You know, how water supply should be, how fisheries should be, how forest, how pastures, land should be, uh, should, should be protected or, or or safeguarded all these information so it comes from the ishtihad it comes from the ishtihad the origin it come the original idea he was able to get it from quran and sunnah and then he was able to make his own so that is what actually uh, his his strength right this is what we need to learn today that whatever that we are uh, doing in today so we have to look into that way and then we need to think and we need to become uh, the expertise in that uh, that is what actually today we needed so this is the part where we uh, we actually let it go we actually you know we we, we we forgot to do that 
we became only uh, the um, you know informations that like we carry the information and we pass the information this is what today uh, we are doing especially to through the through the conventional economics we must be the one who you know uh, carrying it and then showing it to the world the right pair instead we became just the carriers of what others been doing all right so um, and then um, these are the canons and principles of taxation that he says uh, he suggested four canons of taxation you see all these things you heard about it early equity certainty convenience economy these four canons actually been discussed even before adam smith even thousand years later only Adam Smith actually was able to discuss this. He believes in the politics of common good by eliminating oppression and establishment of justice and welfare of the people as the foremost duties of the rulers. He proposed the ability to pay principle of taxation only the surplus wealth of people should be taxed. Right? This is what uh, we discussed earlier. You cannot actually uh, uh, ask people to pay because of the measurement of the land. If they don't have the surplus wealth, where they are supposed to pay, they will become. Some people may have the land, but still they are poor. Remember that land is given, but if the land is the dead land, if it is the dead land, they cannot do anything, or they don't have the resources to uh, start farming then still the owners of the land still consider a poor people, not the rich people. Today is the opposite. Huh? Today, if you have the land, you will be considered as, 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 as a rich man, rich people, because there is a mortgage system. The bank will be ready to give you loan based on your ownership of the land. Right Today, things are changed, but those days, that was the situation. You may have the land, but you may you may not have the resources to run the land. Uh, he opposed tax farming, a practice by which a tax collector could confiscate land in case of delinquency. He opposed fixed levy and land and suggested a proportionate tax on agricultural produce, which he said was just and create greater incentives for bridging or bringing more land into cultivation and yielding larger revenue for the government. So he also proposed the convenience in terms of time, space, and the manner. So there are lots and lots, you know, he talks about it. He talks about the uh, reducing the corruption. He talks about the centralized tax administration. Even he talks about the supervised salary workers, you know. Um, and then also uh, so many things if you can just go through one by one you know you can you can read all these things uh, he also the, the the book itself uh, talks about Ghanima, Kharaj, Jizya, Wealth Acquired there are so many uh, if you can see uh, there is also uh, you know uh, talks about there's also a talk uh, he talks about those soldiers who been into war how you supposed to help them you know, if they are disabled or something. So which fund you should give it to them? This has all been been the subject of those days. Other economic issues like, you know, the, uh, he opposed the price control, which we call the by the ruler as it was normal among scholars in Islamic economic thought to free the market, holding monopoly and leave the determination of prices to the forces of supply and demand. I think that's all from me. So this is, um, the uh, attendance today.